Hello! This is day 30 of reading one canto of the Divine Comedy every single day. We are on Inferno, Canto 30, and I'll read through it before giving some brief comments. Twas at the time when Juno was enraged for Semele against the Theban blood, as she already more than once had shown, so reft of reason Athamas became that, seeing his own wife with children twain walking encumbered upon either hand, he cried, Spread out the nets! that I may take the lioness and her whelps upon the passage, and then extended his unpitying claws. Seizing the first, who had the name Learchus, and whirled him round and dashed him on a rock, and she with the other burthen drowned herself. And at the time when fortune downward hurled the Trojans' arrogance, that all things dared, so that the king was with his kingdom crushed, Hecuba, sad, disconsolate, and captive, when lifeless she beheld Polyxena, and of her Polydorus on the shore of ocean was the dolorous one aware. Out of her senses like a dog she barked, so much the anguish had her mind distorted. But not of Thebes the Furies, nor the Trojan, were ever seen in any one so cruel in goading beasts and much more human members, as I beheld two shadows, pale and naked, who, biting, in the manner ran along that a boar does, when from the sty turned loose. One to Capoccio came, and by the nape seized with its teeth his neck, so that in dragging it made his belly great the solid bottom. And the Aretine, who trembling had remained, said to me, That mad sprite is Gianni Schicci, and raving goes thus, harrying other people. Oh, said I to him, so may not the other set teeth on thee, let it not weary thee to tell us who it is, ere it dart hence. And he to me, that is the ancient ghost of the nefarious Mira, who became beyond all rightful love her father's lover. She came to sin with him after this manner, by counterfeiting of another's form, as he who goeth yonder undertook, that he might gain the lady of the herd, to counterfeit in himself Buoso Donati, making a will and giving it due form. And after the two maniacs had passed, on whom I held mine eye, I turned back to look upon the other evil-born. I saw one made in fashion of a lute, if he had only had the groin cut off just at the point at which a man is forked. The heavy dropsy that so disproportions the limbs with humors which it ill concocts, that the face corresponds not to the belly, compelled him so to hold his lips apart, as does the hectic, who because of thirst one towards the chin, the other upward turns. O ye who without any torment are, and why I know not in the world of woe, he said to us, behold and be attentive unto the misery of Master Adam. I had while living much of what I wished, and now, alas, a drop of water crave. The rivulets that form the verdant hills of Cassentin descend down into Arno, making their channels to be cold and moist, ever before me stand, and not in vain. For far more doth their image dry me up than the disease which strips my face of flesh. The rigid justice that chastises me draweth occasion from the place in which I sinned, to put the more my sighs in flight. There is Romina, where I counterfeited the currency imprinted with the Baptist, for which I left my body burned above. But if I here could see the tristful soul of Guido, or Alessandro, or their brother for Branda's fount, I would not give the sight. One is within already, if the raving shades that are going round about speak truth. But what avails it me, whose limbs are tied? If I were only still so light, that in a hundred years I could advance one inch, I had already started on the way, seeking him out among this squalid folk, although the circuit be eleven miles, and be not less than half a mile across. For them am I in such a family. They did induce me into coining florins, which had three carats of impurity. And I to him. Who are the two poor wretches that smoke like unto a wet hand in winter, lying there close upon thy right-hand confines? I found them here, replied he, when I reigned into this chasm, and since they have not turned, nor do I think they will for evermore. One the false woman is who accused Joseph, the other the false Sinon, Greek of Troy. From acute fever they send forth such reek. And one of them, who felt himself annoyed at being, peradventure, named so darkly, 
smote with a fist upon his hardened paunch. It gave a sound as if it were a drum, and Master Adam smote him in the face, with arm that did not seem to be less hard, saying to him, Although be taken from me all motion for my limbs that heavy are, I have an arm unfettered for such need. Whereat he answer made, When thou didst go unto the fire, thou hadst it not so ready, but hadst it so and more when thou wast coining. The dropsicle, thou sayest true in that, but thou wast not so true a witness there, where thou wast questioned of the truth at Troy. If I spake false, thou falsifiest the coin, said Sinon, and for one fault I am here, and thou for more than any other demon. Remember, perjurer, about the horse, he made reply, who had the swollen belly, and rueful be it thee, the whole world knows it. Rueful to thee, the thirst be wherewith cracks thy tongue, the Greek said, and the putrid water that hedges so thy paunch before thine eyes. Then the false coiner, so is gaping wide thy mouth for speaking evil as tis wont, because if I have thirst and humor stuff me, thou hast the burning and the head that aches, and to lick up the mirror of Narcissus, thou wouldst not want words many to invite thee. In listening to them, I was wholly fixed. When said the master to me, Now just look, for little wants it that I quarrel with thee. When him I heard in anger speak to me, I turned me round towards him with such shame that still it eddies through my memory. And as he is who dreams of his own harm, who dreaming wishes it may be a dream, so that he craves what is as if it were not, such I became, not having power to speak. For to excuse myself I wished, and still excuse myself, and did not think I did it. Less shame doth wash away a greater fault, the master said, than this of thine has been. Therefore thyself disburden of all sadness, and make account that I am I beside thee. If e'er come to pass that fortune bring thee where there are people in a like dispute, for a base wish it is to wish to hear it. So this chapter picks up right where the other one left off, and the person who was speaking to them at the end of the last camp canto, uh, Capoccio, he gets bitten by this other rabid shade who just goes and pulls him away. The conversation is cut off. This reveals one Master Adamo, or Adam, who was uh, a counterfeiter. The Florentine uh, currency was supposed to have 24 karat gold, and he used 22. So Dante speaks to him to learn a little bit more about the other shades who are nearby, as well as who that crazy one was that bit somebody and ran off with him. And in the process, we learn of the presence of a few notable shades, some from antiquity, some from the Bible, and some from uh, Dante's modern Florence. Gianni Schicci, per Mark Musa, was enlisted to impersonate somebody's dead father so that his will could be altered. And then, in the process, he also altered the will to give himself a nice prize as well. Mira comes from Greek mythology. She disguised herself in order to seduce her father. Potiphar's wife, who is not named here, was the one who accused Joseph, Old Testament Joseph, of uh, making unwanted advances on her, when in fact she was the one who did it. This gets Joseph thrown in jail until he develops a reputation for interpreting dreams, then gets Pharaoh's attention in a good way. And then lastly, there is Sinon, the Greek, who was the one responsible for convincing the Trojans to bring the Trojan horse into their city. He misrepresented his relationship to the Greeks. I don't know the exact story, but it sounds like he made it sound like he was an outcast or that he was leaving them, that he had no love for them, and so was able to represent himself as someone who had the Trojans' best interests at heart when he offered them the horse. But once Master Adamo points out Sinon, the Greek, the two start to get into an argument, basically just about which one of them is worse, which in hell is a very... Uh, pointless conversation. And Dante's listening with rapt attention, just as we are, looking at the back and forth. And then Virgil stops him and teaches a very important lesson. Keep right on looking a little more and I shall lose my patience. Just by saying that, Dante's ashamed that he had a taste for talk like this, and he's immediately sorry. And Virgil forgives him, of course, but then he says, if ever again you should meet up with men engaging in this kind of feudal wrangling, Remember, I am always at your side. To have a taste for talk like this is vulgar. 
certain reality TV shows come to mind that usually feature uh, various angry people just attacking each other and arguing with each other for no good reason and for, for no real benefit. How many of us watch that? What good is it for us? Virgil's point is about, you know, what kind of talk you should have a taste for and that you shouldn't want to listen to something like this. But I would argue it might even be a little bit sinful. This is what is called by some as the sin of curiosity. Now I know what you're thinking. Let me explain. Curiosity can be a sin insofar as it leads you away from God. If you're curious in the sense of wanting to learn more, like actual good knowledge, or like if you're a scientist, if you're making advancements, that's good curiosity. Or if you're here on this channel, curious about what insights and wonders the great works of literature have to offer you, that's good curiosity. That will benefit you. That will benefit your soul and your life. But if you're curious about learning the dirt on somebody just for the sake of knowing it and being like, oh my gosh, he's so bad or she's so bad, no other reason than to ooh and ah at them. Or perhaps you're curious about these things to stimulate your own imagination about things that you don't do but kind of wish you could that are bad. Yeah, that's a sin. This is good to think about in an age where we are always consuming content. Be mindful of what you're looking at, what you're reading, what you're listening to. Is it really benefiting you? Is it making you a better person, more knowledgeable in a real way? Or is it wasted time that you're never going to get back? Wasted attention that you're never going to get back? That's not to say you can't enjoy entertainment now and then that has no other distinct educational purpose besides your your entertainment. Resting is good too. No, this is more about being mindful of whether that entertainment is having a direct negative effect on your soul or not, or leading you into sin, or if it's providing to you near occasions of sin, opportunities to sin, or um, affection for certain sins. This is a very good lesson from Virgil that we should all take to heart. That's all for today though. I'll see you tomorrow.